All right, now that I've got my composited image and I'm happy with it, I've got to save this guy. Right now, it's still Fox Flat PSD, and I can see that I haven't saved it because it's got this star next to it. So let's go ahead and save a copy of this working file first. So I'm going to go up to File, Save As, or you can see with the shortcut here, it's Shift Command S. So File, Up and Save As. And here we have a number of options and a number of files that we can save it as. So right now I'm going to keep it as Photoshop. I'm going to definitely make sure that my layers are still checked because this is my working file. And I'm going to keep this color profile embedded. The color profile is pretty important as far as um, you want to make sure that you are in the same working space that consistently. If you switch around different working spaces, then you will be damaging your files and it will be harder to work with in the long run and have consistent results. So whatever color space you start with, just stick with it. Uh, color management and color spaces are actually a whole, um, a whole nother advanced topic. So with this, I'm going to do Fox 1, let's do bird working. Yay, so now I have a new file, Fox bird working. Um, that means I can still go in here and play with these little dudes. Make them fly around, maybe fly, fly them up here fly them over there, whatever. There's still layers in the file. I can still work with them. Another file that I can save as that will still contain layers is a TIFF file. Tagged image file formats are able to accommodate layers. They're also able to accommodate color profiles. However, they don't accommodate the full range of, of, of functionality that can be used in Photoshop with advanced techniques. So TIFFs are nice because sometimes they can be compressed. If I go ahead and save this as a TIFF, you can see I can use compression. So if I used, let's say, zip compression, not supported by older readers, so you have to be careful you're working with people who are using newer readers, or you can use different JPEG. Again, it's giving me these warnings. These will make a smaller file size than, uh, in the end, than your PSD format. Uh, I'm not going to save this right now. I'm just going to leave it as it is. Um, but I just wanted to show you that that is an option. Um, let's go over and look at a few more of these options. The options you'll see most often, see there's a lot of different options here and there's reasons for all of them. Some of them are still used, some of them not so much. Um, some of them are used for very specific industries such as DICOM, that's a medical um, imagery, Photoshop Raw, uh, if you're doing things, high, um, you really want to get into a photographs and you're a phot photographer and you want to um, manipulate the raw data from your camera, Photoshop Raw files, JPEG, JPEG 2000, PNG, Ones you'll see the most are Photoshop files, JPEGs. Photoshop PDFs are not quite the same as PDFs that you may see in other from other um, Adobe programs. They have um, their own particular personality. Uh, it's not quite the same as if you were using a form PDF. Um, not quite the best file format because of that. They have 
some drawbacks. Um, PNG, portable network graphic, um, and TIFF. So again, we already talked about how TIFF and Photoshop files are the two ways that are probably best to save your working files, as they are the ones that are able to sustain layers. So even though JPEG is in this um, scenario here, there's a better way to save out for a JPEG. If I want to save for a JPEG, say, um, if I want to save for a JPEG for print, which some printers ask for, first thing I would do would be to flatten my image under layers flatten, which combines all of the things. I want to make sure I'm absolutely done. And I would go up to file, save as JPEG, and then do for print. And then keep it the maximum file size. So you see, even with the JPEG compression on this right here, it's a 33 megabyte file when it's open, but with the compression, it's only 10 and a half megabytes when it's saved out. This is still a JPEG that is. Let's see what this is at 300 ppi. Oh, and let's not resample it. Remember, resampling adds pixels where there were none. So the highest quality print that I can get um, is about 9 by 14. If you go higher than that, there are some, there are a few high-end printers that can handle that these days, um, but most printers will not be able to support more, more um, data than that and will just throw it away in the process. If you have a file that's saved out that's higher than 300 ppi at final size, say I have this here, and it said it was at 600, not 6,000, 600, not 60,000. If I tried to print this on a 4x6, my printer would just throw away the extra information. So I'm using a, um, a file that's bigger than what the printer can actually handle. So the translation process takes longer and it doesn't, and it just doesn't help the quality at all. Um, so to optimize your printing time, and your images. Just think of what they're going to be 300 ppi at their final size. Unless you're doing a fine art print and then you'll ask your printer and ask what the maximum ppi dpi that they would like to see on your file would be. Um, so the other thing we can do is go export, save for web. cool thing about Save for Web is it can give you different optimized versions. If I have a specific pixel length, if I want to use this, say, as uh, the background for my website, I'll have an 1800 pixel width. I can go ahead and do that and it'll process it for me. 
so I can see what different file sizes would be like, what their quality looks like in relationship to one another. In this image we were starting with a pretty good image and histogram so it doesn't break down too too far. But sometimes if you're using stock imagery or your own images and you don't know where they come from or things that you've taken off of websites, uh, which if you take them off of websites, please do credit where they came from, uh, you will see degradation between files. You can sort of start to see it a little bit in some of the finer patches here. The difference between um, JPEG GIFs and PNG. GIFs index their colors so that only certain colors are available. It, photographs need a gradient to be able to be translated as photographs correctly. So you can see with the GIF here, it's only got 265 colors in it and it's starting to break down a little bit next to the image here. PNG8 is another file format that's similar to GIF. It's a portable network graphic. It's an older file format. Um, and you can see it a lot in here. If you really look at the clouds or see how it's starting to fall apart a little bit in the trees versus your original trees over here. PNG24, however, is a wonderful file format. PNG24 can handle gradients and it can handle transparency. One of the reasons why people like GIFs is they're able to ha handle transparency. Um, we don't have any transparency in this image, but say I was, uh, I had a circular logo and I wanted the circle to be able to move with my website and I didn't want um, it as a square, I wanted it as a circle and be able to do whatever it needed to do. I would have to save it either as a GIF or GIF, um, however you want to call it, or one of the PNG formats. JPEGs do not support transparency. If you save something with transparency in it, in a JPEG file format, it will come out as white. Um, this can be problematic when you're building websites. PNG8, again, it is a file format that is a little bit deprecated. Deprecated means old, not used as much anymore. And you can see um, Mr. Fox's hair is starting to fall apart a little bit more. Um, again, here in the sky, you can really see it coming out. While PNG24, smooth, much smoother. So I've got my file size, or I can do do it 20% of the original, save, save for web, Foxbird for web, PNG, and press the save button, we're good to go. So I hope that helps you understand a little bit more about file formats if you didn't know that before.